the very funny, very smart Nell Scovell to be interviewed by the very brilliant Jamie Kapler. So Nell, welcome to Rancho Mirage. You're the first speaker we've had flying on their own plane with her husband piloting today. And uh, we thought it was Beyonce arriving. <laughs> Nell, tell us about your family growing up in Newton, Mass. What was it like? Was your family funny? Um, well, first of all, just to be clear, we don't have a jet. It's a Prius with wings. <laughs> so that, just to be clear. Um, and, and thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to be among people who still read books. <laughs> yeah, all of you. Uh, so I grew up in a very funny family and um, first generation, my grandparents uh, never finished beyond high school and only one of them made it through high school. And we were in Newton, Massachusetts. Wait, your, your mother, Sookie, met she was at College of William and Mary. She Virginia, was. And she met your father. Why did they meet? They were the only... They were, they were the only two Jews in Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> he was stationed with the army right. down there, and she was a math major, actually, at William and Mary on scholarship. Wow. And um, they had five kids. I'm the middle child, which is, you know, I'm funny, pay attention to me. <laughs> um, and... Uh, you know, we all had family dinner together, and everyone was very verbal, and it was really the best training I could ever have for being in a writer's room, because you had to figure out a way to get your point in. Um, and uh, I had two hilarious aunts. Um, I tell a story in the book about my Aunt Pinky, who uh, once, my sister Alice, was reading Little Women on the couch, and Pinky walked over, tapped her on the shoulder, and said, don't get too attached to Beth. <laughs> <laughs> and, your, and your dad, throughout, throughout your book, your dad is this voice that comes back to you at moments of crisis in your life. And we'll sort of get to that, which I think is interesting. Now, were you the first in your family to go to Harvard? No, I wasn't. Um, but I do want to say about yeah. my dad. So my dad is unfailingly honest. And um, there's, there's a story about, uh, I write for Vanity Fair, and they make a little caricature of me, and I think it's really adorable. So I send it to my dad, and he um, writes back, it's not flattering, but it looks like you. <laughs> <laughs> And this story isn't in the book, but we went to one of his, he went to Yale, and one of his wow. uh, roommates um, uh, died. He's 90, and I'm so happy he lived to see this book came, come out. But um, we went to his friend's old roommate's funeral, and the man's daughter gets up and said, my father always said I was the most beautiful girl in the world, and I start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad's like, what's so funny? And I said, I will not be saying that at yours. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great because, you know, I think when you grow up with mm. that kind of honesty and... and but you I, said as a writer, yeah. you didn't identify with the, the, the problems that other people have, the overbearing mothers and all the tragedies that you heard from other writers. You said, I have a normal mother who's normal and I love her. And that was unusual, wasn't it? Yeah, a lot of, you know, there, there's a belief that you have to have a tortured childhood to be funny. Yeah. And, and I don't believe that. I mean, I think, you know, I believe what Kurt Vonnegut said in seven words, some people are funny, some are not. And <laughs> it, it, the, that includes people with torture. Now, my mom was amazing. So my mom goes to my third grade parent-teacher conference and the teacher says to her, um, Nell makes too many jokes in class. Could you ask her to tone it down? So my mom delivers the message on my 40th birthday. Oh. <laughs> That's great. Absolutely That's true. Great. <laughs> and, and she really, you know, she waited till I'd created Sabrina and had a whole career great. before telling me my third grade teacher had notes on my personality. <laughs> <laughs> So, t so you go to Harvard and you decide to write for the Crimson. 
Which Only because I failed at science. <laughs> but you, you, did, did you cover sports at Harvard? I did. So I um, was raised where, you know, you became a doctor or a lawyer, and I didn't want to, I, doctor wasn't going to work out, lawyer seemed too boring. So journalist was like the, the other right. thing you could do. Right. And I get to the Crimson, and a guy stands up and says, anyone who's cool, stick around. We're going to talk about writing sports. So I'd never been cool in my life. <laughs> and this seemed like a great opportunity. Because I knew I grew up in Boston in the late 60s and 70s right. and watched the Red Sox. Would you tell the, the, the title of the headline for the track team when they had a tie? That, oh. you, that you wanted to, you led, your, you led the story with this headline. Well, there's an old saying in sports that a tie for first is like kissing your sister. And so I was covering, uh, it was a, a um, multi-school track meet, and the Harvard team after one day was tied for second. Um, and so I wrote, if a tie for first is like kissing your sister, then a tie for second is like French kissing her. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it didn't make it in, and you know, I do, and I, I was incensed, but it, it, I really feel if you're a comedy writer and you've never been told you've gone too far, you haven't gone far enough, and if you're constantly told you've gone too far, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you graduate from Harvard, and your first job, I think, is with the Boston Globe. Yeah. And you become a reporter covering sort of everything. High school sports, but high yes, school, all high, different. High school sports. And then you get a call to? Well, I moved to New York, and I, this was just very lucky. Spy Magazine, I don't know, does anyone remember? Yeah, so Spy was this really snarky, um, magazine that in the 80s that poked fun. The, the very first cover story of Spy was the 10 most embarrassing New Yorkers, and it included Donald J. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was Graydon Carter, the editor or co-owner yeah. of the magazine? So Graydon was the editor, and I was there for a year. I was the first reporter they hired, and then Tina Brown calls me one day, and, um, well, before you leave, tell yeah. us two of the headlines, because two of the stories, I think, are brilliant, and that's about the dog. Right. And, the, and the, you could never be too... So, my first piece was called, um, was about pampered pets on the Upper East Side, and it was called, How Rich Is That Doggy in the Limo? <laughs> <laughs> and we found, like, people were having, giving their Sharpays cosmetic surgery. <laughs> and, Literally, yeah. And, and there was one client who didn't want her dog to gain weight because she couldn't fly her. Oh, on Air France had an 11 pound weight limit. <laughs> <laughs> In first class, so yeah, her poodle had to stay spelt. <laughs> I love that, and then you saw the Duchess of Windsor had a needlepoint pillow. Right, that said you can never be too rich and too thin. And um, so this was the era of Tom Wolfe and Bonfire and the Vanities and the social x-rays. Go-go years. Go -go years. Yeah. And so I wrote a piece about women who were both too rich and too thin. What did we you, even say, had what did you say about Nan Kepner? Oh, well, she... So Kurt Anderson, who was my editor for the piece, said, well, Nell, no one's going to... Women are not going to tell you their weight. And I said, oh, these women will. <laughs> And sure enough, Nan Kempner very proudly said, I'm 5'9", I weigh 115, while wearing my fur coat. <laughs> <laughs> so N Tina Brown calls you and... Oh, wait, can I talk yeah. about one other piece I did for of Spy? Of course, of Which, um, it was my final piece, and I stood outside of Lincoln Center at about 20 of 8, and I asked passersby, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> And then I wrote down how many gave me directions and how many gave me the punchline. That's good. That is <laughs> Some good. were so happy. Did you use that in Letterman? Did you use that as a piece in Letterman years later? Oh, I won. Uh, I don't know. I, you have to write specifically right. for that show. So we go to Tina Brown calls you. What does she say? Uh, she says, I've been reading You and Spy. You should come work for me at Vanity Fair. I go to Graydon Carter and I 
say, I got this incredible offer, I'm leaving Spy, and he says, you're making the biggest mistake of your <laughs> life. And then three years later, he becomes editor-in-chief of Vanity Fair. Um, <laughs> And we had a good laugh over that one in his swanky office. Have you, have you continued to write for Vanity Fair over the years? And has that been a sort of ongoing relationship you have with Vanity Fair? It, it has, and I really treasure it, in part because I've always felt like TV was going to go away at any moment. Even 30 years into my television career, I'm still convinced, like, if I have to go back to magazines, I could. Right. But when you read your book, you realize you're always worrying about the future. <laughs> you're not enjoying, shall we say, the present. There, there are moments where you enjoy it. But, uh, so what are some of the articles you wrote for Vanity Fair? What were, your what were you think some of your best? Oh, um... Well, I did one where, you know, the, we asked the question of people, what three books would you bring to a desert yeah. island? Um, I asked uh, visual artists, what three paintings would you bring? Good question. Um, and someone I remember said I'd bring one of those Jim Dine paintings <laughs> with all the tools. <laughs> tools. Yeah. That's good. That was good. That yeah. was a good idea. So your was your first, the first show was It's Gary Shandling Show. And yes. tell us about Gary Shandling and your experiences on that. Uh, well, I wrote a spec script for that show, and they, um, I get a call that they want to buy it, which is like a rookie hitting a home run in his first at-bat. And they fly me to L.A., and I'm going to get notes on my script. Um, and that's when I meet Gary Shandling. And the first thing he says to me is, you write like a guy. Amazing. Is yeah. it, it, when did you play ping pong with him? Well, that day he decided he, he didn't want to do notes, and um, he did offer to take me out for a tour of the set, and there was a ping pong table there, and I had grown up after dinner, my brother and I would go play ping pong every night for about an hour, so we had a good game. How was that experience working with Gary? How was that? Well, it ended up... they. They decided not to produce the episode I'd written. They asked me to write another episode and then didn't produce that. But they paid me, so it, it was um, kind of a perfect first experience because it was everything I needed to know about Hollywood. And which you were is the first woman. You were the first woman on the Gary Shandling show, weren't you? Writer? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, they... they I never actually worked on the show in the end, although I stayed friendly with, with Gary. Yeah. Who, by the way, you know, if you've seen his stand-up, he talks a lot about failed relationships and being very insecure, and I think he wrote like a girl. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. That's yeah. nice. I like, I like that. I like that. So you got advice from, from Al and Mike. Can you share that, the three pieces of advice? <laughs> Advice for an aspiring writer? Okay, if I can remember. Um, the, these guys, Al Jean now runs The Simpsons and has for 20 years. Yeah. And he and his co-writer, Mike Reese, are two of the first people I meet um, in Hollywood. And they tell me um, the three things. Is, one is, yeah, uh, never be afraid to write on spec. Great advice because, you know, you have to you learn every time you write a piece. So it's never wasted. Never Even if wasted. it doesn't sell, it's never wasted. Two was don't ask your friends for work. And their theory was if they're friends, they know if you're looking. And if they want to offer you a job, That's they good will. Advice. Okay. And, and then the third was, you know, take any job that comes your way. And you've certainly done that. I certainly. <laughs> you've crossed over from TV to movie to writing to to working for, for the president, writing jokes. Yeah. It's sort of amazing. You've I can't keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> so would you tell about meeting Penn and, and the elevator story about Penn? Has generated, what's his last name? Ben? So Penn and Teller, Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller. Um, this is, I was working for Rolling Stone magazine at the time, and they had a movie coming out. And I interviewed the two, and then Penn, it was in kind of a, seedy Times Square office building. Right. And Penn offered to walk me to the elevator to see me out. And boy, if that elevator had come right then, my whole life would have been different. Right. But we're waiting and waiting, and we'd kind of run out of chit-chat. 
And I look over at him, and he's 6'6", 250 pounds, and I just blurt out, you know, Penn, if a volcano erupted right now and covered us in lava, they dig up our bones in a million years and assume I was your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> And he uh, liked you. From that moment he on, he liked you. Yeah. And so tell us, tell us some of your exploits. There's one in particular that I was surprised. <laughs> that well, you... what I loved about being friends with Penn is he, um, he included me in all the activities, even though it was, they were all with men. You know, I, I talk about joining his merry band of misfits. So... We would go see movies every Friday night at midnight in Times Square, and there were all these rituals. Every time you saw a skyline, you had to yell, Chicago, <laughs> even if like the Eiffel Tower <laughs> was in it. <laughs> and you know, so Times Square, people forget this is the 80s, 80s. was really seedy. seedy. And um, there was one day where he and a bunch of the guys were going to Show World, which was... Sex show. Yeah, and, and they um, had uh, peak shows and all that. And I was like, well, that seems interesting. Um, so I joined them. I didn't stay long, but it's it still, I was really grateful that so often, you know, I think men assume like, well, I'm not going to invite the woman to go to the football game because women don't like football. Well, right. lots of women do like football. Women like sex. Yeah, <laughs> and women, there are women who like sex. Um, but it was, uh, and, and Penn really thought I was funny. He was a huge influence so that Penn, way. So Penn introduced you to Colin. To my husband, who's here today. And Colin flew you in today, and Colin does, is an architect, and... Didn't he design a house famous? He designed a house, I'll tell the story. He designed a house yeah. for Penn that I happened to go and see. And will you, will you tell him about this house? Well, if Penn were a house, he'd look like the slammer. And it was, it was a nutty place, but it made total sense for him. It was a prison him. with a guard tower and war, barbed wire <laughs> fence around it. I on the was, outside, on the outside, but inside, it was a it game. Was, it was a game show. It was it was being in the game. Yeah, but it was the, a prison from the outside, but paradise from the inside. Um, extraordinary house that yeah. your husband designed. It's one of my favorite, memorable houses oh, I've ever seen. Oh, so nice. So let's go forward to the Simpsons. Tell us about your experience on the Simpsons. Simpsons. So I watched the premiere of the Simpsons at home and do something I've never done before or since, which is I called my agent at home and said, I want to write right. for this show. And The Simpsons was not a, a hit out of the gate. I don't think a lot of people were begging to write for this weird cartoon. Um, but I just thought it was so funny. And by funny, it, I thought it was so mean. <laughs> and, and at the time, shows were very mushy, you had the Cosby show, you know, that was, and they always ended with hugs. And The Simpsons was doing scenes like the family goes to group therapy, and they're hitting each other with foam bats, and then Homer stops and says, wouldn't this work better if we took the foam off? <laughs> and what about the, the blowfish? So they, they um, said I could come in and pitch some ideas, and one of the ideas I pitch is that Homer eats blowfish and thinks he's going to die and has 24 hours to live. And the reason they liked this episode was it was so early in the show, they felt you could really explore the character of what would he do with 24 hours. Amazing, amazing. And, and you know, when you see a show on TV, it's the tamest stuff that gets to the air. <laughs> Good point. And I still remember there was a joke where so Homer thinks he's going to die. He goes to visit his father, who's known as Grandpa Simpson. And Grandpa Simpson says to him, I know the greatest tragedy is to outlive your children, but it doesn't feel that bad. <laughs> <laughs> did, so, was, that did not make it onto the show. It's so harsh. <laughs> so we, we've had Mona Simpson speak at our Writers' Festival. Did you, ever, did you get to know Mona? I do know Mona, yeah. yeah. She's Steve Jobs' sister. She's a great writer. She's a great writing teacher yeah. at U UCLA. So next stop on the Nell Scovell show tour is Letterman, David Letterman. 
And right. this is, I think, of all the chapters in your book, I think it is something that is so personal and so important. And I think transformative for you and for the reader. Well, certainly in retrospect, I mean, at the time, I'm not sure I, I understood the power dynamics of that office. Um, so Letterman's my dream job. He's this giant in comedy in the 80s. I've been sending in material to try to get on that show for years. Um, there was one female writer early on, Meryl Marco, who was also Dave's girlfriend at the time. She leaves for two years, they have no women on staff, and then I get a call saying Dave wants to meet me. Um, the interview goes well, I get hired, and very quickly I realize this dream job isn't such a dream. Um, you know, I really, it, it wasn't a very professional atmosphere. I, I describe it as a soap opera or almost like the court of Louis XIV where, you know, it's a, this hierarchy and everyone's trying to please the king. You close your door so you don't have to see David Letterman when he arrives at 11 a.m. Guys wouldn't have done that. Guys would have been out there. Why did you close your door so you wouldn't have to see him? Well, um, I mean, I want to be clear that I was never personally sexually harassed by Dave, and he, uh, he actually was very kind to me. He would stop by my office and say, uh, do you need anything? Can I get you some soup? Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and um, it, was, it, was, it was really nice until one of the other writers uh, mentioned it in the writer's room that Dave seemed to be paying a lot of attention to me. And I felt very strongly that I, I didn't want anyone to think I'd gotten the job for anything but my talent. So I started closing my door right before he would, uh, he would pass it. Uh, so I, they, I'm, you know, I'm doing fine on the show. I'm contributing to the top 10. I, I remember my very first top 10 contribution. Tell us that. You, tell us that. It was the um, category was the top 10 least popular summer camps. And mine was Camp Tick in beautiful Lyme, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> uh, and so they pick up my option. I'm, I'm getting ready to settle in for, you know, another six months, and I can't sleep, and I realize I don't want to be in this atmosphere where um, the, it, it was just too political. You choose not to suffer. Yeah. When, you, when you find yourself in your book aggravated or something's not working, you pick up and leave. That's your extraordinary person to do that. You don't say, you don't say in relationships, you don't yeah. say, so sorry. Well, but there's that great Bill Tilden quote that I have on pillows in my home, which says, um, uh, never change a winning game, always change a losing game. Now, this may be sensitive, but um, in your 20s, what was your favorite, early 20s, what was your favorite pursuit? <laughs> so, I'm quoting you in the book, so for the book. <laughs> I, okay, so I'm, I was divorced twice by the age of 26, which was... Um, what did Mel say, your, your father yeah, say? Yeah, my, my father described it as having two very serious relationships. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I was a real romantic, and I had, my parents had this great marriage, so I thought if you were in love and the guy asked you to marry him, you would be married, and that was it. And... Um, so it took a while, and I do think one of the reasons I became so devoted to my career was because um, I was such a failure in my personal life. <laughs> well, but you say that, you say it was a benefit, the, the only benefit was that you basically, you'd already gotten the marriage out of your system. Right. So when Colin walks in your life, and you decide you, you're, you, have, you have your yeah. first son, Rudy, yeah. and when did you decide to get married? Who gave you away, and who was at the wedding? So it was my the third wedding. <laughs> third. <laughs> oh, God, it's so awful. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, um, uh, it was just me, Colin, and Penn Jillette. He married you. He married us, he yeah. Married. He got one of those certificates. And, uh, and what did you said? The, you said your husband said the sexiest thing to you a man has ever said. 
Yeah, we were still dating when he said to me, um, if you want to have kids, I'll stay home and raise them. Come on, is that the best? The best. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And it's, and it's worked. And you have two sons. Uh, one's at Harvard and one's just graduated from... One's Re at Reed. Reed yeah, and one's graduated. One's at Harvard. I'm really... Yeah, and I, um, you know, only 4% of men are stay-at-home dads. There are more 4%. female CEOs than there are men who stay home. Extraordinary statistic. Yeah. Did you get that from Lean In? I you might have. have. Might have. So, <laughs> so, so, so tell us about Coach and working on Coach and Craig T. Nelson. So Craig T. Nelson, Mr. Incredible, um, <clears throat> is, is one of the more tortured actors. Oh, thank you. I got this. Um, I've ever worked with. And he's, he's brilliant, but boy, does he make the writer suffer, you oh. know, to get him there. Sorry. Yeah. It was an unpleasant experience for you? You know who's great, though? Mark Who? Harmon. Ah. He was a delight. An I NC worked on NCIS. And he was, he was a real professional. People forget that he was a football star. That's at right, UCLA, a quarterback. And, and his father was a great quarterback, a great coach, yeah. I remember. And, uh, and he, he has internalized that. I, I think he yeah. really does see himself. Candace Bergen was magnificent. She was very similar to Mark. And there are certain people who know they set the tone for the set. So if they come in and they're professional and they know their lines, everybody will. Um, so you go from working on shows to creating a hit, one of the great hit TV shows, Sabrina. So would you tell us about how that came about, and, and, and then would you tell the Stephen King story oh, as, sure. far, as part of this? I love that. <laughs> Thank you. So Sabrina the Teenage Witch was a comic book that I did read as a kid, and um, I... After Murphy Brown, I went on a development deal. I made my first pilot um, that... Uh, starred Laura Bell Bundy, who went on to play Elle Woods on Broadway in Legally Blonde. Uh, it didn't move forward, and I get a call out of the blue saying, ABC has this commitment to make Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Do you want to, um, are you interested? So it was kind of a perfect job for me. I loved um, science fiction and fantasy, and you know, the one, two, three on the call list were all female. Um, and it was a really, it was kind of a subtly feminist show. I rewatched an episode recently, and in it, Sabrina, they're skiing on Mars. <laughs> um, and uh, Sabrina's got a cute ski instructor, and they're um, having a picnic, and he leans over to try to kiss her, and she pulls back. And then he says, if you're feeling uncomfortable, we can go back to the lodge. And I thought, boy, in 1996, I was really trying to model to these young women, right. you know, how you, that situation should go. Right. Did, so did that show, as, sorry, as Howard Stern would say, that show make you rich? That show, um, you know, the, the quote I always use is, um, I don't have fuck you money, but I do have, I don't like your tone of voice money. <laughs> Bravo, that's great, great. Um, how is Caroline Ray, Caroline Ray? She is funny in her bones, I adore her. Have you met her? I have, your, your picture of her in the book was somewhat <laughs> strange. So I, I didn't include the whole story in the book because I didn't want to make her feel bad, but one week Caroline did not know her lines. And I was very frustrated because I really counted on her. Um, there were other problem actors um, so the next week was a hiatus and I was rewriting a script. So I decided to, um, you know, punish her a little by creating a spell that gave Aunt Hilda a bushy beard. <laughs> so Caroline had to spend the next episode with this bushy beard. <laughs> but the joke was on me because she never looked sexier. I don't know <laughs> how it happened. <laughs> hey, tell us about Stephen King. Was it, were you surprised when he called you and said, I love the show? Well, so this is about, the, this came later when I was working on the X-Files. Oh, the X-Files, okay. But it's kind of connected because I do love science fiction. and yeah, It's very unusual. I mean, I, I don't mean too many women that, lo Helene loves science fiction. You oh, are, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So you um, do too. No, I stood in line for that first Star Wars, and I, I 
love that stuff. So one of my favorite shows was The X-Files, and I went in and I pitched them some stories, and Chris Carter really liked one of mine and said, go write the outline. You've got our last freelance episode. And I write the outline, I turn it in, and I'm waiting for my notes. Phone rings, it's Chris Carter, and he sounds happy, so I'm excited. <laughs> and he goes, we have great news. And I'm like, yes. He goes, Stephen King wants to write an X-Files. And I'm like, that's terrific. And he goes, yeah, we're going to give him the last freelance assignment. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. you know, it was hard to feel bad because it's like you're painting a mural and Picasso comes by and says, I'll take over. And you're like, well, have at it, Pablo. Right. Right, um, you say, of course. Yeah. So, so you move, you move, you start doing your award shows, and you've done many award shows. Tell us about the Emmy show with uh, John Stewart and your idea. Was it your idea about the jeans? Oh, so this wasn't an, for, quite for the Emmys, but um, I come back. Sorry, um, after directing my first movie, and I'm not sure. What was the name of the movie again? Let's that was Haley Wagner Star. It was about a. Um, 16 year old washed up has been actress, child actress who has to go to high school for the first time. <laughs> That's good. And uh, I'm not quite sure. I want to direct another movie. In the meantime, though, I don't want to stay out of writing for too long. And I hear that Jon Stewart's taking meetings with people to um, help create a new show. So this is right before he gets The Daily Show. Now, my husband and I, we had two kids in schools in L.A., and he, I knew John wanted to do the show in New York, so it really wouldn't have made sense, but I wanted to meet him. We had mutual friends. So I go, and we're just talking about late-night TV, and I point out there's a dead spot in every late-night TV show, which is the host finishes the monologue and then throws to the band leader. So why, do, why does he do that? It's because the host is about to turn his back on the audience and walk to the desk. Right. And it's a faux pas in the theater to turn your back to the audience. And I said, um, he said, so what would you do? So, <laughs> who here remembers there was this crazy Ryan O'Neill movie in the 80s called So Fine? Does anyone remember this? You do? All right, so Ryan O'Neill creates these genes that are... I, they, they show the butt in the back. They're, like, they're like open. Like Frederick's of Hollywood type of... Yeah, and it's... I, I, the 80s were weird. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to tell and you. The, and the movie poster for this you have in the book, and it's hilarious. It is hilarious. Anyway, so I said to John, well, what if you were wearing these so fine jeans <laughs> so turned, that every time you turned around... <laughs> it's on your butt. You'd flash the audience. <laughs> and it, it was a joke, and it, but he, he wasn't... He said, are you serious? And I, uh, I knew I didn't want to move to New York, so I doubled down and was like, well, you wouldn't wear them every night, just on some nights, so it would be a surprise. <laughs> that was, when you said that, that broke me up. <laughs> that was absolutely priceless. Dave, you, did you see John Stewart again over the, t over the years in your, in your career? I have, and I've never brought it up. Also, someone, recent, someone later told me um, he's uh, um, a little sensitive about that body part. So maybe I pressed the button. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, take us through Ste Seinfeld, how that, your experience on Seinfeld. Oh, so again, you know, people forget Seinfeld was on the bubble. And, and it took them three seasons before people started watching. And I, I don't think they were even a top 20 show until the fourth season. Were they still on Thursday nights on, on the first two years? Are they moving I'm around? not sure. It was actually called the Seinfeld Chronicles originally. The first two years. And so I reproduce a, a letter in my book where my agent had submitted me to the show and the executive said he liked my material, but the big question was, would Seinfeld be back for another year? And you have that framed in your office. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, because to me it symbolizes just how crazy Hollywood is and... You know, it's, it, there's no, um, it's just not a science. <laughs> so tell us about your Robert Altman experience. You first growing up, your, one of your favorite movies. Is Nashville. Yeah, I love the movie Nashville. And uh, who, who was the star of Nashville? Ronnie Blakely. 
And Lily, Lily Tomlin. Tomlin. So Lily we'll, Tomlin is magnificent. It might have been her first Oscar well, nomination. It was, and we'll come back to her because yeah. I think that she, you have a very special relationship there. Tell us about Robert Altman. So he, um, he had an idea for a project which would have involved Carol Burnett, who was one of my heroes growing up. I mean, I loved her show so much. And the idea would have been to travel around with Carol Burnett and do kind of a semi-documentary uh, style, semi-scripted um, show. And it really was sort of my dream. And I met with them and they were like, get ready to leave on a moment's notice. <laughs> and he calls me then the next week and, and uh, he had had a tempestuous meeting with CBS and the deal was off. But, you know, I, I say in the book that, look, if you like disappointment, Hollywood is a great career. But, you, but, but you, you pick yourself up and you go right on to the next challenge. Larry David. How do we do it? Volume. Volume, volume. <laughs> Never say no, right? That's your advice from Al. Yeah. So tell us about Larry David and your pitch to Larry David. Oh, okay. Can I read from the book? It's yes. not very long. I think that's... Um... Are you enjoying this? Okay. <laughs> So, this is page 200, I found. I know. Yeah. Um, so, this is right after um, I, I, I'm talking about Seinfeld. I did eventually get a chance to work with Larry David. In 2007, Curb Your Enthusiasm threw out a net soliciting ideas for the upcoming season. I typed up a few notions, including one where Larry needs to bring flowers for a hostess gift and decides to steal them from a roadside memorial. <laughs> Larry bought the concept and turned it into season six, the, the Ida Funkhauser Roadside Memorial. The show didn't give me on-screen credit, but they paid me $2,000. Larry also gave me his word that the show would pay writers better in the coming season. With that incentive, I pitched some additional story er areas. Larry seemed interested in one concept, but it didn't move forward. A year or so later, we both attended a book party. It was at Arianna Huffington's house. Um, our mutual friend, Kimberly Brooks, introduced us. Larry, do you know Nell, she said. Nell, of course I know Nell, Larry said. In fact, I was just talking about you today. Whoa. Larry David was talking about me? That felt good. Really? How come? I asked. Well, one of the producers said that you'd sold us two ideas for episodes, but I insisted it was just one. We argued about it, and now here you are. You can solve the mystery. Oh, I said a little disappointed. It was just one. Yes, said Larry, happy to have been right. But you did like another idea of mine, I added quickly, trying to save face. Which one? The one about the pea drinker. Larry looked confused, so I repitched the idea. Larry's at a party with a guy who won't stop talking about all his thrilling adventures. The guy goes hiking in the Himalayas, helicopter snowboarding, sailing around Tierra del Fuego. And in every story, he runs into complication, complications and recounts how, in order to survive, he was forced to drink his own pee. <clears throat> Later, Larry sees the thrill seeker go into the bathroom with a near empty bottle of beer, and when it comes out, the bottle is filled to the brim. <laughs> <laughs> Larry watches as the guy takes swigs from the beer bottle and becomes convinced that this guy is drinking his own urine. The great adventures are just a cover. The truth is, this guy is purposely putting himself into life or death situations because it's the only socially, socially acceptable way to drink your own pee. I didn't say to die at the end of the pitch, but it was implied. I looked at Larry expectantly. He shook his head and offered one long, drawn out syllable No. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Nell. So, Nell, the movie... I still believe that would have been a good episode. It would have been a great episode. <laughs> and I think our audience agrees. 
Honey, we shrunk ourselves. Yeah. Tell us about that. So this is the third of the uh, series. Uh, a honey trilogy. Yeah, which honey, started, honey trilogy. Yes, much like the Star Wars trilogy. Um, and it was so much fun. I, I worked with my friend Joel Hodgson, who created Mystery Science Theater 3000. Um, and Our it's just... Erstwhile, um, friend uh, relationship or yeah. admirer of yours? Or <laughs> Did he ever marry the English actress? He did not. No, no. So uh, lots of regrets there. But... Um, <laughs> And that was fun because Joel's a very visual thinker. And so we got all these little miniature like train figurines. Perfect. Uh, model train figurines. Yeah. And we like, I had wicker chairs in my living room. And we realized that if you're that small, wicker's like a ladder. Perfect. And you can climb them. And uh, so that was fun. And it was, I think, Rick Moranis' last movie. It was. It yeah. was. Murphy Brown. Which is coming back. I know. Who's going to play Murphy? Um, well, she's playing Murphy, and her son Avery is, I forget, they just named who that was. But you know what I just realized the other day? We still have a vice president who would object to a single mom. That's true. Right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. And don't you think it's interesting? Her daughter has become such a important person at Vogue. Yeah. Um, NCIS. We had, I was there yeah. when Louis Maul came and did a walk-on, and I Were actually wow. wrote a line for him, which um, was really, he was hilarious when he delivered it, which is, at one point, Louis Maul says to Murphy Brown, I'd hate to be the man married to you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. NCIS. So NCIS was a show that I never dreamed I would work on, but... Um, it doesn't fit your, your MO, does it? Although it is funny. I mean, there, it, there's a lot of character comedy, and the, the guy running it, Don Belisario, legend, created Magnum P.I., Quantum Leap. Would you tell the story about your script? He comes in, the four oh, parts yeah. of the script, and what he says. I think it's... I, I, it's, I had to reread that again. So I pitched an episode. There's an old movie, DOA, that could, where a guy comes in and says, I want to report a murder who's my own, and he's been poisoned. And um, it's, a, it's a great movie, and I sort of stole that concept for the beginning of this NCIS, which had to do with radium poisoning. Right. Um, and I write, I, I pitch out the story, I get approval, I write the whole thing, I turn it in, and Don calls me into his office and he says, uh, Nell, I love the teaser and acts one, two, and three, but I want a new killer. And I say, well, so I need to rewrite the whole episode? And he goes, no, <laughs> don't change a thing, just give me a new act four. And I say, okay, Don, but you know all the clues are gonna point to another guy. <laughs> and he didn't care, so I went back. <laughs> but here's what, it was such a good what did you lesson. Learn for that? What did you learn from that? So I rewrite the fourth act. Yep. The show airs, people love it. And I read the boards and everyone says like, I, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the genius of Don Belisario? It might be, but it, it was good instruction because I think when a writer, writers get really caught up in everything needs to tie up in a pretty bow. But most people watching TV, they're just along for the ride. And, and so it was okay. As long as they were surprised at the end, they were happy. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. So would you talk about how Facebook got you to Mark Zuckerberg and how Mark Zuckerberg got you to Sheryl Sandberg? And, and I think this is amazing. Mark, you've got to share with our audience about Mark Zuckerberg because we've all glued to the set last week. Yeah. He's, and would you tell us about, you go on Facebook. Well, it, it, it started with, um, I had a friend who was in the communications department at Facebook, and we reconnected on Facebook. I was actually an early adopter and joined when you still needed an EDU address. Right. And um, I'm a writer. Like, if I don't have to actually... Um, interact with a human, and I can do it through writing, I'm happy. <laughs> so, uh, 
The Simpsons wanted Mark to be on an episode, and they, he wasn't happy with the jokes they wrote for him. So my friend Elliot asked me if I could do some, and that worked. And then Mark was going to be on SNL, and um, I wrote some jokes for Did him. Did you tell the story about the three Marks? Oh, it was Jesse Eisenberg, Andy Samberg, and Mark all were, were on the episode together. And I, um, you know, Mark is not like the character in The Social Network. I mean, Aaron Sorkin has never met Mark Zuckerberg. It's amazing, amazing. Yeah, and Mark is, is delightful, and he has a really good sense of humor. Um, so... One day, though, Elliot writes me and says, have you ever seen Sheryl Sandberg's TED Talk? And I write him back, um, seen it, I memorized it. So Sheryl, in, the back story is in 2009, um, David Letterman goes on air and says, uh, I have had sex with women who work for the show. Um, and... I end up writing an article for Vanity Fair about my experiences on the show, and I pivot from discussions of harassment and sexual favoritism to a discussion about gender discrimination in the writer's room, because in 2009, both Letterman and Leno had zero female writers. Space. And in 33 years on the air, Letterman had never employed a writer of color. Amazing. It is. I mean, you That's literally perfect. can't do worse. Right, <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> so I had been outspoken about that. And then in 2010, Cheryl d gives this TED Talk called Why We Have Too Few Women Leaders. And it's amazing. And, and it really made me understand certain things. Um, she talks about sitting at the table and that women need to sit at the table. And she means that metaphorically, but also literally. And early on, when I'm working on Newhart as a writer, I didn't sit at the table. You sat at the end. Yeah, I you... sat with like the assistants in the yeah. periphery. Yeah. And no one waved me over. So, um, you know, I learned to sit at the table. But I had always thought that was a personal thing. Uh, that was my choice not to sit at the table. And when I heard Cheryl talking, I realized it's a cultural you, it, um, behavior that women don't want to seem too aggressive. They, they don't want to seem too ambitious, so you hold yourself back. Anyway, so Elliot put Cheryl and me together. She was working on a speech for Annapolis at the time. She's running the company. She has two small kids. She asked me if I would help um, expand her outline into a full speech. She's speaking at the Naval Academy? Yeah, it, it's wow. called the Forrestal Lecture. Oh, wow. And in, um, in the book I print, um, in those notes she sent me, it says, tell women to lean in. And it was the first time she used the phrase. What did we say before, lean in? I don't, you know, women did not want to be seen as ambitious. So we didn't say anything. And what the genius of Cheryl, who is just one of the greatest marketers uh, of all time, um, is lean in is so non-threatening. <laughs> we always joke if I had written the book, it would have been called barge in. <laughs> and no one would have bought it. But um, <clears throat> so, you know, she and I had a just, we have the best collaboration. So you started with a speech. Yeah. And, and then she gets a Barnard commencement address. And that really, those two speeches are the backbone of the book. And then she asks you to co-write, lean in? Yeah, she calls me one day and said, look, I got an offer to write a book. And I said, I, I'm not going to do it without you. And I said, Cheryl, I've never written a book. And she said, neither <laughs> have I. <laughs> and, and how many um, books did you sell? <laughs> As someone joked, who knew the big coin was in feminist literature? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Lena has sold over four million copies. Bingo. Yeah. Ka-ching. Congratulations. Yeah. Over the world, yeah. Uh, but even more amazing is there are 35,000 Lena circles. We talk about, talk about two things. Tell a story about being at a book signing, oh. and a young woman comes up to you, and then talk about the foundation that you have helped start on this. I think it's really amazing. 
Yeah, so at one of our book parties, a young woman came up to me um, and asked me to sign her book. And I said, uh, you don't want my signature, it's Cheryl's book. And she looked at me kind of aghast. And I realized I had just spent eight months helping to write a book. And your name is on the front of the book. Yeah, telling women to own their success. And there <laughs> I was backing away. And, you know, it's just so deep in our culture. Um, and then I love that, I, so I signed her book, um, and I uh, wrote Cheryl about it that night because I thought it was so interesting that my knee-jerk reaction had been to do that, and Cheryl wrote me back, there's a book you should read. <laughs> <laughs> She's really funny, actually. It's a wonderful book, and I urge everyone to read it. Of course, option B yeah, is which I helped edit. such yeah. a great uh, story of... of coming back from such a tragedy. and to, Tell us, you have two, young, two adult sons, and you're the only woman in your household. What, do you, what, do you, what is your advice in, to your sons about their relationships and, and treating girls? Well, I, I did encourage them always to have friends who are girls, and I think that's really important. Do they always go to co-ed schools? Yes. Because my problem was I went to an all-boys school <laughs> through college. It was, it was tragic. It was tragic. Yeah. I'm, all my problems are because of that. But you... You're, <laughs> you're, you're, so you encourage your sons to have friends who are girls. Yeah, from a very young age. And I'm really amazed that they do. And they... You know, it's... Uh, our youngest son was asked to do, a friend of his was doing some psychology survey and, um, about growing up, and he called me that night and said, I had no idea how weird it was that dad raised us. <laughs> 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 but his friend had said he was the first person to say that. That's amazing. Yeah. But I always made um, breakfast. I want to talk about that. To because... Talk about that because at home when you grew up, it was dinner. Yes. But you come to... What was breakfast, and you made it. So family dinner was really important, but, you know, I, I didn't control my hours when I worked on a show. Yeah. Um, but it's Hollywood, so you usually didn't have to be there till 10. And so I would get up early and make um, breakfast for the boys. We, and uh, it became codified into Crates Thursday. So that was, I would make pancakes or... Um, uh, eggs and bacon or, you know, and, but every Thursday I made them crepes and we would sit around and talk. Yeah. So bef I think that last would be talk about a funny president and how all of a sudden <laughs> you go, you're the Hollywood connection for Washington. Tell us, tell us about that. Oh, so, um, this is through Facebook again, through Cheryl. Everything amazing okay. <laughs> comes through Cheryl. Uh, President Obama was vi visiting Facebook, and they asked me to um, write some, come up with some opening remarks. And I write a line that was something like, uh, you know, uh, President Obama has 18 million followers, half a million more, and he'll be tied with SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and um, I get a note back from the communications person saying, now we're trying to honor the president, not roast him. Meanwhile, Favreau, John reasons. Favreau, the speechwriter, um, Cheryl told him this joke, and he said, you know, that would be funny if the president told it. Brilliant. And because uh, he's so self-deprecating. Um, and. I thought maybe we do, do you want to show the video because that's yeah. it. John wrote me and said, "Can we use that joke?" And I said, "I am happy to serve my country." <laughs> Would you like to see it? And then he invited me to write. And then um, Hillary, I did some writing for Hillary too, for the Al Smith dinner. It's. I've been to the Al Smith. My name is Barack Obama. <laughs> my mother was born in Kansas. <laughs> my father was born in Kenya. And I was born, of course, in Hawaii. <laughs> this is such a special event that I took a break from my rigorous nap schedule to be here. <laughs> this is the third time that uh, sure. Governor Romney sure. and I have oh. met recently. Uh, as some of you may have noticed, uh, I had a lot more energy in our second debate. Uh, 
I felt really well rested after the nice long nap I had in the first debate. <laughs> Everybody loves Michelle. We made a terrific team at the Easter Egg Roll this week. I'd give out bags of candy to the kids and she'd snatch them right back out of their little hands. <laughs> <laughs> Snatched them. <laughs> but Donald, we have so much more in common than actually you may realize. For example, I've tried to inspire young people by showing them that with resilience and hard work, anything is possible, and you're doing the same. A third grade teacher told me that one of her students refused to turn in his homework because it was under audit. <laughs> And if Donald does win, it'll be awkward at the annual President's Day photo when all the former presidents gather at the White House, and not just with Bill. How is Barack going to get past the Muslim ban? <laughs> Ultimately, though, tonight, not about the disagreements Governor Romney and I may have. Uh, it's what we have in common, beginning with our unusual names. Actually, Mitt is his middle name. I wish I could use my middle name. <laughs> we also both have degrees from Harvard. I have one. He has two. What a snob. <laughs> I've even let down my key core constituency, movie stars. Just the other day, Matt Damon. I, I love Matt Damon. Love the guy. Matt Damon said he was disappointed in my performance. Well, Matt, I just saw the Adjustment Bureau, so <laughs> right back at you, buddy. <laughs> Obama out. <laughs> now, on behalf of all of us here at Rancho Mirage, we are so honored you chose to come here. And we appreciate oh. so much. You did a, done a lot of TV and radio in the last day, and we thank you for all of us. And if you, Nell's going to stay and sign your books, and we're honored to give away her book today. It's the first time we've done this. And Nell, thank you so much. Oh, and thank she'll be here you. to ask questions. <laughs> thank you.